are locked into the Cowbell Kingdom podcast, frontline coverage of the Sacramento Kings. Now, here are your hosts, Jonathan Santiago and James Ham. Welcome to the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. I am James Ham. Uh, with me is always Mr. Jonathan Santiago, and today we are joined by another guest, Sean Cunningham, News 10, and a, a myriad of other things that Sean Cunningham does. But, Sean, how are you? Good, man. Good. How Jonathan James? How's it going? Good, man. Yeah, the dog days of summer are, are almost over. We've got training camp in less than a week, and Pete D'Alessandro is, like, literally cramming. Does it, does it feel like he's cramming for a test? It's like, <laughs> oh, wait, wait. I, I, need, I might need a small Ford. I, I, I might need a... a another big man and i mean is that what it feels like right now sean yeah it certainly does i mean you know obviously you get the two guys signed today with with caspi which we all kind of knew and just kind of had to let the dust settle and with the national team and um get him over with the physical and and finally just inevitably sign him and try and stay under this 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 luxury tax and then of course with ryan hollins as well but yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, so many guys coming in. You still had two guys in working out here in Sacramento today, um, Josh Howard and Mike, Michael Petrus. I mean, it's it's just bizarre. And you got so many, so, a pretty loaded training camp roster and so many moves. And, yeah, it seems like his tinkering is, is not yet done and, and all the while trying to stand under that dreaded salary cap or that, that uh, you know, luxury tax. Yeah, I don't know about you, but just – even though these are minor moves that they've made lately, it just certainly feels like they're they're loading up to like pull the trigger on something big, or they may have something teed up. I don't know. Does that does that feel the same way to you? Definitely. Yeah, I think they've. I think at least in Pete's mind, and uh, you know, it's kind of a a bizarre place to try and step in his mind because I I think he's <laughs> he's such a brilliant guy and and has so many things going on uh, upstairs and, and he's always seems like he's playing three or four or five steps ahead of the game um, in thinking of ways to reshape his roster as evidence from last year. Um, whether or not they actually work out is still yet to be seen, but yeah, I mean, he's very calculated. He's, he's always trying to, he wants to, it seems like he wants to be involved in every single possible transaction out there whether he feels it can help the team right away or just be in the mix you know you'll, you'll see the Kings always tied to a free agent a trade report um, I think that's kind of in one sense it's probably refreshing to a lot of fans because historically in the Jeff Petrie area in the era you didn't really hear too much of that um, now when you hear them linked to so many guys um, sometimes they don't come to fruition but yeah I think they've identified several uh, moves that they they want to make in 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 efforts to really make this team not only better for this season, but everyone circling 2016, right? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, we've asked this question before, Sean, on, on the podcast of other people, but do you think that there is a major danger in like literally raising your hand every time someone might be available and, and being out there? I mean, it's almost like that kid in, in like like second grade who <laughs> who literally knows the answer to every question, and so is you know, it's like. Just put your hand down. Um, but you know what I mean? It's like, is there a point where you've, you've oversaturated yourself in the trade market? Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. And I agree. I was going to use that same, you kind of beat me to it. I was going to use that same analogy of the kid that, that dork that raises his hand in class and it just annoys <laughs> the rest of his classmates. I, I mean, and it's true. I mean, I mean, the rest of your peers start really kind of rolling their eyes at you. Like, you know, as you, as evidenced by really what you saw um, with the Grantland piece that I think a lot of the people were like, oh, that's right on. What the hell are they doing? Um, but, you know, I, he, Pete still maintains that he's got a plan. And I think it's confusing a lot of people. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the thing that I think was just the most, um, you know, the, the most glaring was obviously he was going to bring in his own people, right? I mean, he wanted to get rid of people from the old regime, and by people I mean really the the, the roster, the players, um, and the front office, and, he, and he's and he's done that, yeah, and ran parts into the front office as well. But he's really done that, and he's reshaped this. Now, now, what do you have? It looks like just this kind of unorganized, sorted matter with a lot of still dead weight at the power forward. Um, and you're right. I think I think you do run into that fatigue of if you're going to be involved in every single thing or try to do too much that you know, I think it kind of wears on not only the fans but others as well. And and 
you know, to say that this is a finished product, I, I mean, he would never say that. And I don't think we could agree to, that he's going to do that, that. That's a finished product either. We're talking to Sean Cunningham here of News 10 um, on the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Sean, uh, kind of switching gears here, you caught up with Omri Caspi. Uh, what did you guys talk about? What did he say about why, why he's decided to return to the Sacramento Kings? Well, I, and in fairness, actually, we were we had a we had a meeting set up this uh, this evening for a for a feature interview, and uh, we actually uh, postponed it a little a little bit. Um, he was supposed to, he was going to come in, and we were going to talk to him and uh, kind of figure out where he was at. And then all of a sudden, the the, the signing kind of became official. But he's been in Sacramento for a few days, and then kind of in, in in talking with people with him and 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 about him. I mean. Sacramento, they open their arms to him. The, they're, they're, they love the fact that he can run the floor. They love the fact that he can shoot. And they love the fact that he's been humbled, right? I mean, this was a guy who came in and he envisioned himself Michael Jordan. I mean, guys, he would never pass up a shot, and he tried to do too much, and he, his ego was a little inflated. Well, being cut from a team and being rejected by really two or three teams um, really has a funny way of humbling a guy. And this is kind of a, you know, really low risk move for the Kings to get a guy that they feel can help them. Granted, I mean, he's probably the 10th guy on the team. I mean, maybe you guys disagree, but um, in some ways, if they want to be a running team and an up-tempo team, I think not only does Omri Caspi think that this is a great situation for him, um, but I think the Kings are looking at it as it could be pretty advantageous for them, especially with being very, very low risk. You know what I saw from Omri Caspi, especially in his last season in Houston, was that he improved greatly as a defender. And I I guess having Dwight Howard having your back helps, but it it also doesn't help you to have James Harden, who's a complete sieve, in front of you. (laughs) So I, 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 but I, it's something he didn't do as a young player. He didn't play great right. defense. He didn't stay in front of his man. And the other thing that I always loved about Omer Caspi is he has such a, a quick first step as a rebounder, and I don't think he's ever been utilized properly as a rebounder. Are these things that, I mean, he can shoot the three a little bit. He can play the stretch four. He can play the three. How is he going to fit in with this roster? I think that yet, that's yet to be determined. I mean, I think it has a a big um, emphasis on what really they're going to do with guys like Ben McLemore, Derek Williams, and more than anything, Rudy Gay. Um, you saw a lot of Rudy Gay, and you've heard that possibly the possibility of him playing the, the power forward and at times if they want to, you know, go small. Um, you saw him do that in FIBA. Um, I think that a lot of te- I think a lot of people are thinking that Rudy Gay is going to get a lot of minutes at the power forward, um, so that guys like McLemore, um, Stauskas, and Collison can be on the floor at the same time. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm in that camp yet. I, I really I have a big question mark there because I don't know what to expect because, you know, last year I saw some good things from Omri Caspi in Houston, like you said, improved defense, but I did see a lot of the selfish play that, that, was, that, that he had in the two years that he was here in Sacramento. Um, so if they feel that, that he's humbled, that he can kind of buy in and, and look to run, then, then great. Is he a good teammate? Absolutely. I mean, he's he's a great teammate, and uh, you know, as long as Demarcus Cousins and him are are, are good, I mean, I think that's going to filter all the way throughout the rest of the locker room, and they share the same agency. So I can't imagine. I, I know that Demarcus is really big on having Omri, but Omri on with this team, and and look, as long as he's not trying to do too much, I, I knows his role that he is a role player, and that he was almost out of the league. I think he could be. I think he could be advantageous. You know, you you bring up the fact that uh, the last time around, maybe, I mean, while he was a good teammate, he was extremely selfish. But going back to that team, it was a really selfish team. So, I mean, you kind of have to look at, you know, the Baina Udra and uh, and Tyreek Evans' backcourt. I remember talking to Omri on the sidelines in pregame a couple of times where it's just like, man— they just won't pass the ball. It's like we understand that Tyreek's not going to pass the ball because he's the guy. But, mm-hmm. you know, Bano is also a point guard. He needs to pass the ball, and the rest of us are just dying or just, you know, shriveling up on the vine. But that's kind of what happened last season in Sacramento again. It, you know, Isaiah yeah, Thomas is the only guy who's passing the ball. He's the only guy who's bringing the ball up, and he's relied on for so much. And then on top of that, he's got to get his 20 points a game too because he's in a, in a contract year. So, I mean, is this a perpetual cycle that we're seeing in Sacramento that somehow they need to end? That, you know, like, like 
spousal abuse in the NFL. They need to end the cycle of, of you know, selfishness in Sacramento. Oh, no doubt. I mean, I think that's the whole reason why Isaiah Thomas isn't here. Um, the pounding of the ball, you know, wanting to to encourage, you know, pass first, leak out, run. Uh, absolutely, no doubt. And I think that's why Omri Caspi is looked at as such a um, – a possible piece, maybe not a big piece, but someone who can help facilitate that culture. Uh, and I agree. I, I mean, I think if, if Kings fans are, are the, the last thing Kings fans want to see is, is that style of play. It's not attractive to watch. And, um, you know, hey, when did when was the Kings at their best? When they were zipping the ball and they were moving it, and things were happening, and it was creative offensively. And and you know, they played they played decent defense. They were still a good defensive team, but the offense was clicking. And I think Kings fans definitely want to see that happen again. And you know, Caspi hopefully can facilitate that a little bit. But I still think they need another ball handler. I don't know what you guys feel, but I mean, like we said, not a finished product, but another ball handler. I know Pete's been on the record as saying as much, but. Um, where's that going to come from? Yeah, I mean, when you've got Darren Collison as your number one and Raymond Callum, who's got literally like 44 games under his belt as your backup, right. as your backup point, you know, Ben McLemore is not a guy who can either handle the ball or makes great passes. Uh, you're going to be counting on Nick. Nick Stauskas to make a lot of plays from the shooting guard position as a rookie and I'm not sure that that's going to work out as well so you're right there isn't their goal was to add shooting and it was to add passing at almost every position and I'm not quite sure that they did that I do know that they added you know a little bit with Collison a little bit with Stauskas but overall I don't think the the whole package is there yet it's it's a work in progress but you know Sean we talk about a work in progress DeMarcus Cousins he gets his golden opportunity to go and represent Team USA. How did that go for you? I know you've had plenty of sit-downs with DeMarcus. We know DeMarcus mm-hmm. well. But do you think that that can be like the catalyst for his career? It can change the direction of you know sort of his perpetual cycle of getting himself into these situations around the league? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's like I, I, I'd mentioned this through to, via Twitter. I said, you know, FIBA making that FIBA team, Team USA, that was his first merit badge. I mean, that's his first real accomplishment as a professional basketball player. Um, some may disagree with that, and you know, an All Star game would be great, but but this is his first merit badge. Um, if he, I, you and I had talked, you and all three of us had talked a lot when we were in Vegas, and I and you guys knew my stance. I felt it could have a such a drastically bad effect on Demarcus going into next season had he not made that uh, that team. It could have been really bad, not only for him, Agreed. but for the Kings as well. And for him to be able to make that team, and not only just make the team, but have such a really positive impact. I mean, Coach K comes out right after they, they beat Serbia, comes out in the second sentence out of his mouth as he thinks that DeMarcus helped, was the biggest reason they won the game. I mean, for a guy who seeks, you know, DeMarcus is a guy who seeks feedback, whether it be positive or negative. He, he likes the feedback. And I think that's pretty well known at this point. But to hear that feedback, albeit positive, that's got to be a huge boost going into this season. And you know what? what, what what's been the knock on DeMarcus? Well, one of several – all throughout his career is guys who don't want to play with him or guys who think he's a tough teammate. Well, look at having a guy like Rudy Gay there. You've got the two faces of your franchise right now, the best players on your team, able to share an experience like that on a, on really an all-star caliber team. And you're going to take that into Sacramento as Jerry, as Jerry Colangelo told him, take this into Sacramento and run with it. I mean, this has to be your springboard. And, He's got to be a good teammate. He's got to he's got to mimic what happened last year, and he's got to be able to build up build off of that. This guy is going to have his setbacks, and and you know what? Some of his setbacks, right, wrong, and different, they're going to be magnified because of his track record. Um, I think Kings fans and and us alike in the media, we have to recognize that, slap him on the wrist when it happens, but he can't go the other way, and. He's always going to have that magnifying glass on him. And I, I think Team USA was such a tremendous opportunity for him. It's an accomplishment. Um, now now go do something with it, right? I mean, you got to get better in Sacramento. And you and Rudy Gay, uh, you at least have one year to do so. <laughs> we don't know the stance beyond Rudy Gay's uh, future here in Sacramento beyond that, but at least you have one year to build off of this. Yeah, he was – I mean, we saw it last year, you know, to your point, Sean, when – 
he did not make the all-star team and you could tell i mean they were on the road but you could tell that he was frustrated and he let it affect his play and i think that would have oh no doubt definitely rolled over into the season um had the same situation happen with team usa and him not making the team so for him to do it i think it was it was great and you know for him he's i He's like you said. He craves feedback, whether it's positive or negative. And I know he. I know for him, I, I get. I always kind of get the sense that he's a guy who wants respect. Um, but you know, at this point in his career, he hasn't really earned it yet. Up until now, with this Team USA mm-hmm. experience, and I really feel like he's earned a lot of respect uh, for what he's done because you know he he always talks about you know wanting to put things in the past, but all these little issues always pop up. Well, I think with this experience, it was the first time realistically in his career where he really did kind of move past everything and just let it be about basketball and showed everybody why he is, you know, one of the most talented players in the NBA. Yeah. And that's a good point, John, especially with what you said about, you know, him when he, with the sulkiness that he, that he uh, experienced, after not making the all-star team, he was crushed. And I think that was what really drove what I felt would have been equal to, if not greater than that moment. I mean, it took him a month to get over that. We all saw it. Yeah. Um, I think fans saw it. It took him like a month to get over that. And then finally it was like, all right, he's pushed it aside. He's moved on. But it took, it took him like a month to get over that. Um, I agree with you. And, and, and I think it's a real credit to DeMarcus too, in the sense that look, he kept coming back to Team USA. He his starts off. It gets rocky with Colangelo. Um, you've got the quote from Carmelo Anthony saying he's fouling the s out of everybody. I mean, it, it couldn't have started more rocky than it than it did for him. And he kept coming back. He wanted it so bad, and it happened. And 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 you know, I think that I think they recognize that. And the fact that here's a year where you've got guys who really don't want to be a part of Team USA. The Paul George injury happens. Kevin Durant, your face of your of your team outside now that LeBron has stepped away, at least for the FIBA tournament. Kevin Durant steps away for God knows why. You've got guys that want to be there. That, I mean, DeMarcus Cousins wanted to be there, and I think they really rewarded him for that. Aside from the from all the effort he had made, the dropping the weight, the wanting to run, focus on rebounding, passing, and defense. Um, I think just as equal to that was was him wanting to be there, and they recognized that right off the bat. All right, Sean, uh, we want to wrap this thing up with you here on this uh, first half of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. We can't go without mentioning or talking about Peja Stojakovic, the Sacramento Kings, Mm -hmm. announcing this week that they will retire number 16, Ben McLemore changing his number to 23 now that it was open after Marcus Thornton was traded. I mean, you've been around the Sacramento Kings for a very long time. You've seen the great Sacramento Kings and you've seen the terrible Sacramento (laughs) Kings. And you were around when Peja was, you know, doing his thing. I know there's a lot of debate among fans and pundits as to whether or not he really deserves this honor. Personally, in my opinion, I think he does. He played a critical role on those teams. And regardless of whether or not they won a championship, those Mm -hmm. teams were the best teams ever in franchise history but what what's your take on it do, do you think that he's deserving of this honor to have his number 16 hanging the rafters of uh sleep train arena for the next two years and then the new downtown arena in 2016 and beyond yeah i'm you know what if i if i had a gun to my head which obviously i don't uh, I would say no. I would say I don't think Peja Stojakovic deserves to have his jersey hanging from the rafters. That's not to belittle his accomplishments, but I think you've recognized the two guys that were the most instrumental from that group. Uh, you didn't win a championship, and that's, I don't think that should really factor into it, but you've got Chris Weber and Vladi Divac. They really helped turn this franchise around. Hey, was Peja Stojakovic a big part of that? Absolutely. But the big three in the Sacramento area er, era – are retired, and I'm sorry, if you're going to retire Peja Stojakovic's jersey number, Wayman Tisdale, uh, it should be in that conversation, in my mind. I think you retire his jersey before anyone else, but I digress. I mean, I, if, if, I had the, if I had the ultimate, um, you know, judgment on it, I'd probably say, no, Peja doesn't deserve to have his jersey hanging up there. Um, but that's only because I think you have to do so much to, to have your jersey enshrined. Now, granted, 
<laughs> he's not going to be the guy uh, that's the most egregious who's going to have his his jersey hanging from a rafter in the NBA. I mean, there's plenty of those throughout the league. Um, but for sake of argument, I, I think maybe they should build a statue of him someplace, maybe have a wall dedicated to him. I don't know if the jersey's the right move. Do I hate it? Not really. But I don't like the fact that you know they have so many retired jerseys for a team that has, has really not had a great deal of success either. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's really for the fans. I think most fans would say that they're going to be thrilled to see Page's number up there. Um, but let's not forget the accomplishments of Wayman Tisdale, because I think outside of those three, Mitch Richmond, Vladi Divac, and Chris Weber, um, Wayman Tisdale's right there when it comes to the Sacramento era. Well, Sean, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, you know, you're such a part of the fabric of the Sacramento Kings, but you have so many other hats that you wear around town. I mean, you're covering soccer. <laughs> Literally and physically, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You do wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. 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 Physically. Yes. Awesome. So, uh, Sean, thanks so much for joining us uh, on this portion of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Anytime, fellas. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Sean Cunningham, joining us on the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Jonathan Santiago and James Ham here with you. Let's continue on the Peja debate. You know, we uh, we actually reached out, um, you know, to fans. We have this new hotline. You know, you guys can reach us here, leave your comments. Maybe we'll answer questions if you have any. Um, read your comments on on the uh, the podcast, but we we tried this thing out. We sent sent out the message and wanted to hear people's thoughts on Paige Stojakovic, um, you know, being having his number retired by the Sacramento Kings. And we got a couple responses here. We got Ray from Antelope who said, "I think it's awesome. Paige was my favorite player and was not only a Hall of Fame level shooter, but was an incredible passer as well." Aaron from Columbus, Ohio, calling way out there, a Kings fan on the East Coast or Midwest. Peja is one of my favorite Kings players, but this feels like a publicity stunt. Seems like ownership is really trying to harken back to those early 2000s teams. And then Anthony from Sacramento weighed in and said, I think it's great that they are retiring Peja's number and he really deserves it for his great play and for being a great teammate during the glory years and uh you know i wrote something earlier in the week asking people and i actually you know i this is not the first time we've asked people does he deserve to have his number retired as soon as he as soon as he retired from the nba in 2011 i wrote a piece about Peja stojakovic and whether or not the number 16 deserved to hang in the raptors and certainly when you look at the numbers he he is a guy based on when you're looking at it strictly on Sacramento Kings franchise history that it, for me it seems like he's worthy of the honor but i you know there's debate there as to whether or not you know being the in the position that he was i mean i remember james when you did that interview with him and he talked about how it was it was difficult for him when you know, uh, they started to break up the team because he was kind of like the little brother to like the Chris Webb, yeah. and Vlade Divox. And then all of a sudden it's like, now you're the man and you, you're, you we're looking at you. And he really had a tough time dealing with that. And that, you know, I'm sure that reflected on, you know, critical moments on the court when he was playing. But I just think what he means to the fans and, and what he's done for this, what he did for this team you know, I know they had great guys like Hito Turkoglu who were able to come in and and kind of mirror what Peja was able to do when he was hurt, but he was so good. And remember the 2003-2004 season when he was an MVP yeah. day with Duncan and Garnett? He was, he was phenomenal. He was so, so good, and I just – I think he deserves it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so close, right? Uh, I mean, I remember specifically that – they celebrated the night that he uh, he surpassed Mitch Richmond in games played. I think it's like 518 to 517. And the next day he was traded for Ron Artest. And it was like, whoa. It was like earth shattering. Like, wow, I can't believe that just happened. And uh, he was a guy who was on his way out, though. You saw it coming. 
but you didn't see uh, that's that was the beauty of Jeff Petrie and, and I think that's something that we we just can't get used to with the new guys is that the Kings are always in the conversation well when it came to Petrie he was never and there was never any conversation anytime someone was traded I mean when when Chris Weber was traded I swear I, I'm surprised Arco Arena didn't just like flatten like that moment like oh my gosh I can't believe this just happened I mean that's it's so different it's night and day now like look page is a very 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 good nba player and at points in his career he was even great but it's difficult for me because he's not a hall of famer and i i mean i hate hearing people say well then maybe jay will or or maybe mike bibby or doug christie or you know scott pollard bobby jackson you know need to have their jersey retired and I think what separates Peja from all of those guys is that he was there for the entire duration of their greatness. And he he left as the team declined and went away and and became horrible, which they have been for, what, eight seasons straight. Um, so it, it, it is tough. I don't feel like it's totally a publicity stunt. I do feel like that last season when they allowed Ben McLemore to have Peja's number, that was with out any historical understanding of what number 16 meant and i think that there was a lot of negative feedback from the fans at that point that convinced the kings that pageo was important enough to the franchise that they probably needed to take the number away from ben mclemore and and raise it to the, the rafters plus you know publicity does help yeah. The, the Kings do need a reason for people to come out. I'm not sure that, that they need a reason for people to come out against Oklahoma City. On national which TV, is right? On national TV. Yep. So, I mean, it seems like they're kind of taking, you know, going to make the most of that opportunity on national TV. But still, the building would have been filled anyways for a game like that. The national TV games are always packed. And, uh, John, I, I think I think I'm okay with it. And I'm I'm excited because we will get to, you know, see Peja again. He's a great interview. He's very thoughtful. He's uh, he he loves to sit there and talk basketball. And it's it's going to be a pleasure to get to do that again and and have him back in Sacramento yet again. Yeah, I again I I feel like he's definitely deserving of the honor. You know, again he's just and I and I get your point about how he's not a Hall of Famer, but. I had this debate with, you know, uh, other folks too. Uh, when Vla- even when Vlade Divac had his number retired by the Sacramento Kings, I-, I think the 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 retirement of a number is more. It's more about what that player did for that franchise rather than where he stands in the overall grand scheme of basketball history, and what Page meant to this franchise over the course of his career was a lot and you know versus versus like what whether he was again a hall of fame talent or not you know i think and 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 with that said because of that i believe that the sacramento kings are are right to retire his number and it's gonna be uh it's gonna be a good time for everybody involved i'm I'm gonna be eager to see or i'm gonna be interested to see who who shows up for this i'm sure um, you know, with it, I think it's a TNT game, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I, if, if it's a TNT game, for sure they're probably going to have Weber calling, calling the game, doing color. So he'll yeah, probably, that would be he'll be here for nice. it. And I would assume you know Doug Christie has been he was at Webb's and he was at Vlade's retirements. I Doug Christie will be here again. Could definitely see Bobby Jackson, Rick Adelman. I think Rick Adelman should definitely be here if, you know, he's Scott he's, Pollard will Scott probably Pollard. be around. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, so. I was blessed to be on the court the times that they they uh they retired Chris Weber and Vlade Divac numbers, you know, several years ago. And you know, we we've, we've been doing Cowbell Kingdom. Cowbell Kingdom has been around since 2009. We we weren't around this team during the glory years. And I remember being in that building, I just in awe 
when Weber when when Weber came out and they were getting ready to raise the number four to the rafters, I thought to myself, this is what this place must have been like back in two thousand two. I mean, this is incredible. I, you know, the team was already horrible. They were already bad. And the place was just electric and you could feel it. You know, we've talked about times where we've been in this building, whether it was during, you know, the, uh, the relocation sagas and the here we buy nights and you feel sleep train arena, Arco arena come alive. And I think, oh, uh, when I, I've, I was there for playoff games, John, I've yeah. been to plenty of playoff games in Sacramento the glory years and the the stadium had has a soul i mean it, it had it felt like a living breathing thing when you were standing there it was electric and i, I get you know you're right when they did the ceremonies for vlade and they did them uh, and they did it for well but I'll point out, I believe that both of those guys are Hall of Famers. People may think I'm crazy. I say Vlade Divac's a Hall of Famer. Vlade Divac is going to make the Hall of Fame, people. If Sharunis Marshallonis just made the Hall of Fame as an uh, international contributor, as a contributor to the game, Vlade Divac will make the Hall of Fame as well. He's part of the European revolution of, of NBA basketball. And, I mean, it's him, it's Sabonis, it's Draz. Petrovich, it's, you know, you start running out of names. You know, you get Shalonis and Vlog, and those are the guys that really broke the and European game, changed the NBA game with the mixture of the European game. And, and so Vlade Divac, in my book, is a Hall of Famer. Chris Weber, in my book, is a Hall of Famer. I mean, he was one of the best players in the NBA for the majority of his career, and his time in Sacramento. I know was just spectacular. I mean, they were so good. The only if you say he's not a Hall of Famer because he didn't win a championship, then that's just that's just ridiculous. You know, uh, John Stockton doesn't have a championship, and neither does Carl Malone, if I'm not mistaken. He tried to get one there with the the Lakers late in his career. But you know, when you look at this, these are guys that that are Hall of Famer. And when you raise their their jerseys up to the rafters, there's no question. But there is a little bit of question with Peja. And, and, and I'm okay with Peja having his number retired. I'm just saying there is a little bit of question there. Okay, uh, James, is there anything else you want to talk about? We do have training camp coming at, next week um, and media day. But at the same time, a couple minor signs. I don't think we have to dive too in-depth. I don't think the people are clamoring for us to spend 20 minutes on Ryan Ryan Holland Ryan being Holland. signed um, yeah. and Omri Caspi's official announcement. Although, you know, I had it took so long. I remember, uh, you know, I was out in Vegas and I was told by a reliable source, like, they are going to get him. It's just a matter, yes. of, matter of time. You know, it was, and it wound up taking like two months, which is weird. <laughs> but well, he was out of the country yeah, he for was most out of, of that time. Yeah. Um, you can't sign a contract unless you're on U.S. soil, and you have to. And they want to do a physical yeah, too. Yeah, there's a forty out forty eight hour window to do a physical, so they had to do a physical with him, and you can't do it again. It, it's got to be on U.S. soil, if I'm not mistaken. So there were some reasons why Omri Caspi took a while. Again, I don't know what Omri can bring or what he won't bring, and you know there there are you know even Sean. Shin, and in our conversation there, that there, are, you know, uh, a couple other guys, Josh Howard, uh, Michael Pietras, that have come through town. Uh, we're not sure that the Pietras actually, I mean, no, that uh, that Josh Howard actually had a workout, um, but we do know that he was in town uh, working out somewhere. That Reggie Evans saw him. There's no, no confirmation whether that was on the Arco, uh, the in the practice facility, and if the Kings were present for that. Um, so I think they're not done yet. I, I think we're going to see a, a couple more things happen here. I mean, we haven't really heard anything more about Terrence Williams. We haven't seen a training camp roster to date. So there are some things that we'll see here between uh, now and media day, which I think media day is on Friday. Training camp opens uh, a week from Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And, uh, and everything's in Sacramento this year. So we'll definitely have that covered. Yeah, everything's in Sacramento because they will be gone for for like a week in China, and they'll also oh, be going that's to right. Vancouver too. So 
There's a bit of an uh, international flavor to the preseason, and you know, I'm sure Demarcus Cousins is going to have, uh, you know, by the by the time the regular season starts, he's going to have a lot of uh, stamps in his passport. <laughs> Haven't been. Uh, yeah, I just think when Cousins got to Sacramento, he didn't even have his driver's license, and for that matter, I, I don't think he had a driver's problem. license for his first year, and. Nick Stauskas, I, I was listening to something the other day. Nick Stauskas also does not have his driver's license. They don't drive? He's never – no, they don't drive. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, Cousins does now. Yeah. Cousins has his driver's license now. But, I mean, he had his uh, – and Andrew Rogers driving him around everywhere for his first season. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's just – it's it's interesting for DeMarcus Cousins. I mean, just think about when people say just he's so young, he's so young. He is really so young. I mean, he's such a young guy that, you know, I, I doubt he ever had a passport. And, you know, he, getting a passport for the first time is a big deal. Traveling in Europe and, and getting that experience is a huge deal. Yeah, you know, I'm happy for him. I'm happy that he got to experience all that. But again, it's just this is another another step, another step in the, uh, the maturation of DeMarcus Cousins. Yeah, I mean, the, the true test of character is when you face adversity. And the way this team is constructed right now, they are on the path to facing some great adversity this season. <laughs> and we've seen, you know, DeMarcus has been fine in situations where things are, are going well. Obviously, things get heated. You know, he's gotten, he got heated when he was at Kentucky and emotional with, with Coach Cal, Calipari there. And they were a successful team. And with USA, some, there, were, there, there was like one moment there against Jonas Valanciunas. But this is going to be, you know, it's up to him. Yeah, it, it, the, the, it's always the same story with DeMarcus. It's never changed. It's always been up to him. It's his choice. It's his decision to either, you know, react to something or not react to something. Whether it's losing, whether it's a player talking trash in his ear, whether it's somebody elbowing his neck, it's it's his decision and it's his choice. And how he reacts to that is how he's judged and it yeah I, I agree it, there are times where it is very unfair because he does make progress but at the same token you know guys like Ron Artest met a world peace he's a guy who you know got over his incident at the malice in the palace and then the, the second he makes a mistake it's like hey remember he like was the guy who started that melee in Detroit like 10 yeah. years ago I mean it will never leave you you know it's part of your reputation and the thing is just, you know, you can't worry about, worry about it so much. It's very easy. It's easier said than done, you know, to not worry about what people think about you, especially when you're a 24 year old man, young man, but he's getting to a point in his life where, you know, he, he's getting there. I mean, we've been yeah. through it. You know it. I mean, you're, you're a little bit older than me. I am, you know, in my late twenties now. And you go through this phase where once you hit like 25, 26, you start to get into like your late twenties where you start to legitimately not care what people think. And he, I don't think he's yet <laughs> at that point yet. And, you know, We'll see if he can get there, but it's it's going to be uh, – he's definitely primed for a really good season. I, I expect him to – I think so too. Dominate. Yeah. To be dominant. I, he yeah. should be an all-star. He was an all-star last year. He should be an all-star this year. There's no Kevin Love in this conference anymore. So he's definitely primed from this experience with a lot of confidence and a lot of uh, experience to just come into this season and, and really – really kind of make a name for himself in this league. Yeah, John, before we uh, we end this episode of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast, I would like to throw out a hat tip to Paul Westfall, who is now in Brooklyn as a member of the coaching staff in Brooklyn, and uh, Keith Smart, who has joined the Miami Heat, Eric Spolstra staff uh, in Miami. Keith Smart is an assistant coach. So uh, good to see Two of the Sacramento Kings former head coaches getting another look in the NBA, getting another opportunity to uh, sort of reboot and start over. Yeah, definitely. I mean, those guys are good guys, you know, regardless of what yes. they did as head coaches of the Sacramento Kings. 
very, you know, I, I was, I, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to really get to know Coach Westfall, but I did get a chance to, to get to know Coach Martin. He's a great guy, great human being. And both of them, good men, good you, men. You can agree, you can agree to disagree with the way they've ran their teams, and you know, Coach Smart knows from me. I've said things to him about <laughs> the way I've asked him questions that he's probably thought like, "Why are you asking me that? That makes no sense." But um, those guys are definitely deserving, and uh, they are definitely capable of of uh, adding something to the teams that they are now working for. So. All right, James, I think on that note, let's wrap up this edition of the Cowbell Kingdom podcast. Thanks to Sean Cunningham for joining us. And we'll be back next week with our uh, preview podcast of training camp and media day 2014, 2015 NBA season is uh, about to tip off here in just a matter of time. So for James Ham, I'm Jonathan Santiago. Thank you for listening to the Cowbell Kingdom podcast.